Hello everyone. The topic of today's lecture is going to be summarizing data, theory and applications with MATLAB. The topics we are going to cover today are measures of central tendency, think about central tendency as a fancy way of saying average. We will see that we are going to calculate the mean, the arithmetic mean, as well as the weighted mean. And we are going to introduce the concepts of median and mode. The second big topic is going to be measures of dispersion. There we are going to look at the range, the variance and the standard deviation, as well as the coefficient of variation. We will introduce concepts such as the interquartile range or IQR as the abbreviation and quantiles. The last topic today is going to be histograms and box plots. We are going to use four data sets throughout this lecture and we are going to use MATLAB to apply some of the concepts taught in this lecture to those data sets. We are going to have a data set called Meridian Hills 1.csv which represents home values in the Mid Meridian Hills district in Indianapolis. We are going to have a data set called Faithful, which represents the eruption and waiting times of Old Faithful Geysir. This is actually a data set that comes with the statistical software R. Then we have a data set called Norway, which represents the murders, the number of murders in Norway between 2002 and 2018. And then we have simulated data about home values in two different areas. And we are going to use this data set, the homescv.csv, to illustrate the concept of coefficient of variation. So the first concept we are going to look at is called measures of central tendency. Here we are going to talk about the arithmetic mean and the weighted mean. Arithmetic mean is a fancy word for saying average, where we have xi as our observations, n is the total number of observations we have, and what we do is we sum up all the observations we have and then divide by the number of observations, dividing by n. The weighted mean is very similar. Think about your grade point average. Your GPA depends not only on the number of classes you have taken, but it also depends on the credits you have earned for each class. For example, a one credit hour class is going to count less towards your GPA than a three credit hour class. In order to calculate your GPA, based on one credit and three credit classes, you have to use the concept of weighted mean. Now, I have written the equation to calculate the weighted mean below here, but let us look at an example, at the practical example to illustrate this concept. Suppose you take a class and the professor bases the grades on homework, midterm exam, a final exam, a term paper, a presentation of the term paper, and your participation, or your participation in class. And on this slide, you can see that the homework is worth 10% of your grade, midterm exam is 20%, and so on. Suppose that you have the scores of 85, 57, 78, 92, 95, and 10 points, on in those various categories respectively. You can then use MATLAB to calculate your weighted mean. Suppose that you have the following scores in class. Uh, you have uh, 85, 57, 78, 92, 95, and 10. And the weights associated with those scores is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.25, 0 0.1, and 5%. Then to calculate the weighted mean, 
First of all, note that the sum of the weights is equal to one. So when you say sum weights, the sum is equal to one, which means that to calculate the weighted sum, we can type in sum scores dot the multiplication sign weight. So your score in this class is going to be 76.3. Now suppose that your professor changes their mind and does not count the participation of 5% and so just drops the participation. So in this case, you have to note that the weights do not add up to one anymore. So the participation score is eliminated. So now we have here the new uh, scores, but the sum of the weights is not equal to one anymore, but it's equal to 0.9. So sum weights is equal to, actually it's equal to 0.95. So now you have to take this new weight into account. So the equation slightly changes and you actually have to use the equation that is provided in the slides where you have to divide the, the scores times the weights. You have to divide them by the weights themselves or by the sum of the weights. Now, when you execute this, your score now is 79.7895, based on the fact that the score, the participation score was dropped. Okay? So this is how you would uh, implement the weighted sum or the weighted, uh, weighted mean in MATLAB. Now, the arithmetic mean is very useful to give you an idea about the average of your data. But let us consider an example where the mean or simply calculating the mean may be more problematic. In this example here, you have 10 citizens and you have three different states. You can see that in state one, everybody has the same income. Assume it is $10. In the second state, you see that you have a different income distribution where the first resident earns $2 and resident number 10 earns $20. Now compare this to situation in state number three where everybody has an income of $2 except resident 10 who has actually an income of $82. If you calculate the average income in each of the three states, what you will find is that the average income in each state is $10. However, you can see that the $10 does not tell you anything about the distribution. So for example, if you consider state number three, then knowing that the average income is $10 does not take into account that the majority of citizens actually only earns $2. To overcome this issue, we are going to introduce two concepts of central tendency, the mode and the median. Now, the mode is simply the value of observations that appears the most often. So for example, the mode for state number one would be 10. The mode for state number two would be 10 as well, because as you can see, 10 appears twice for resident 6 and resident 7. And the mode for state number 3 would be 2. A measure of central tendency, which is used very frequently, is what is called the median. The median is the value that divides the data set into two equal parts. Two equal parts means that you have, in one part, you have 50% of the observations and in the other part, you have 50% of the observations. And the median is the value which separates the 
bottom 50% from the top 50%. Note that you need to have your observations in ascending order to calculate the median. Now, of course, you only need this if you do not have a computer at hand, but we are going to illustrate this concept by hand. The advantage of using the median is that it eliminates the influence of very small or very large values. Okay? Note that there is a unique median for each data set. Consider the example from Switzerland and you have the average taxable income in Switzerland is $56,805. There is a small town called Vosio-Morge that has an average taxable income of $670,000. It turns out that the town is very small. It only has 178 inhabitants. However, there is one very wealthy person in the, in the town. The name of the person is actually uh, Andre Hoffman, and he is owner of a part owner of Roche Pharmaceutical meaning that nobody in this town actually earns on average $670,000. The majority of people has is probably closer to the average taxable income of about $57,000. And it is only one person that is uh, driving up the average. The median avoids this type of issue. To illustrate the concept of mode and median, let us have a look at the three states with their 10 citizens. Now, first, let us look at the mode. Remember that the mode is the value which occurs the most often. For state number one, that mode is clearly 10. For state number two, the mode is also 10. And for state number three, the mode is two. Now, the more interesting concept is the concept of median. Note that I have ordered the data already in ascending order for all three states. The median is the value which divides the observations in the bottom 50 and top 50%. If you look at state number one, then here the median is 10, meaning that five observations are either at or below 10, and five observations are at five or above, at 10 or above. This is for state one. For state number two, think about, we have 10 observations or we have 10 residents. So think about the dividing line being here. So for state number two, the median is the average between nine and 10. So the median for state number two is 9.5. What this means is that at 9.5, 50% of observations are below this value, those, and 50% of the observations are above this value. That's one. For state number three, here the median is two meaning that 50% of observations are below this value and 50% of observations are above this value. Note that the mean for all three states is 10. Now, if you think about this as the average, this may be true for the first state, but there are problems with state number two and state number three, especially with state number three, since all the wealth, or if you consider this to be income, because all the income is at one person.
Now that we have seen measures of central tendency, let us introduce the concept of dispersion. The dispersion measures the spread of your data, usually the spread around the mean. Now, the simplest measure of dispersion is called the range. The range is simply the largest value in your data set minus the smallest value in your data set. The second measure of dispersion is called the population variance. There is a difference between population and a sample. Here, you're talking about the variance of the population. The variance of the population is calculated as follows. You calculate the mean of your population, and then you take each value, subtract the mean, square the term, sum it all up, and then divide by n. Note that the part xi minus mu measures the distance of each observation to the mean. That term xi minus mu can be either positive or negative. Squaring it makes sure that the term is positive. The population standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance. Okay, again, the standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance. Now, let us look at an example based on the scores that we have used for the weighted mean. In this case, the average across the six scores is 69.5. So what we do to calculate the variance is we take the first observation, which is 85, we subtract the mean, 69.5, we square it, and then we move on to the next observations, which is 57. We subtract the mean and we square it. And we do this for each observation and sum it all up. After summing it up, we are dividing by 5. And we see that the variance or the spread around the mean is 25.71. Now note that the variance represents the average distance squared. This variance can usually be very large. Note that if you are looking at the observation, then it is very difficult to interpret the 25.71 because none of the observations except the last one is that far away from the mean. Hence, we can calculate the standard deviation, which is the square root of 25.71. Note that there is a difference between the sample variance and the population variance. Whereas the population variance, we divide by n, by the number of observations. For the sample variance, we divide by n minus 1. It is very important to realize that if you calculate the sample variance and also the sample standard deviation using the commands integrated in MATLAB, that they are dividing, that MATLAB divides by n minus 1 and not by n. Given a sample, Dividing by n minus 1 is a better estimator for the population variance than dividing by n. But more about this in later lectures. Now, let us apply some things that we have learned so far in this lecture to a sample of 101 home values in the Meridian Hills neighborhood of Indianapolis. We are going to use the command summary to summarize the data. We are going to calculate the range. And then we are going to calculate the sample variance and the sample standard deviation for the data set. Note that the 101 home values are not the entirety, are not the entire population of homes in a Meridian Hills neighborhood. The 101 housing, housing values are only a sample. Hence, we are going to calculate the sample variance and the sample standard deviation and not the population variance and population standard deviation. I have already loaded the Meridian Hills dataset into MATLAB and I have called it MH. This for Meridian Hills, this will cut down on typing. So to summarize the data, what you can do is you can type in summary MH and you can evaluate this. 
And what you see is that there are 101 variables. The minimum value in the data set is $84,900. The maximum value is around $1.5 million. And the median value is $250,000. This means that $250,000 uh, separates the bottom 50% of homes from the top 50% of homes. To determine the range, you can use the command range, which is included in MATLAB. And you can type in range mh.price. This means that we are interested in the column price. And you see that the range is almost $1.41 million. Okay. Now, of course, you can also calculate the range manually by typing in max MH price minus minimum MH price. And you get the same answer. Now, let us get back to the concept of sample variance and population variance. And let us use the dataset Norway for this. So in the dataset Norway, you have the homicides, the number of homicides in Norway between 2002 and 2018. And you can see that there are a total of 17 years. Now, to make our lives a little bit easy, let us first store the value of observations or the number of observations in, a, uh, in an object. And let's call this uh, NOBS, number of observations. And we can use this, or we can assign this by using the command size, Norway, comma one, where one specifies the dimension that we are interested in, interested in the number of rows. This will give us the number of observations, which is, of course, uh, 17. Okay. Now, to calculate the sample variance for the Norway data, we can type in sample, let's call it sample variance, is equal to var, the, the function var, and we can say Norway murder. And here we can see that the sample variance is 50.94. Mm -hmm. If we want to calculate the, uh, if we want to calculate the standard deviation, then there are two ways of doing it. We can say sample standard deviation is equal to, you can use the built-in function STD for standard deviation, and we can say Norway dot murder, and then we get that the sample standard deviation is around 7.13. This makes sense because the sample variance is around 51, so the sample standard deviation should be a little bit over 7. Okay. Now, if for some reason you want to calculate the population variance and the population standard deviation, assuming that what you have is not a sample, but you have data about the entire population, then you have to slightly change your, uh, you have to slightly change the calculations. So you type in, let's call this uh, population variance. Here you can take the sample variance, knowing that the sample, the sample variance was divided by n minus one. So you can multiply by n minus one, which would be knobs minus one, and then divide by the number of observations. Okay. And you can do the same for the standard deviation. So let's call this uh, population STD. Okay, 
So when you execute both lines, now you find that the population variance is 47, almost 48, and the population standard deviation is 6.7. This is how you would calculate the sample variance and sample standard deviation, as well as the population variance and population standard deviation. The coefficient of variation is a measure which makes variances comparable between groups of different means. The variance depends on the units of the observations, and hence it may be difficult to compare variances between two groups. Coefficient of variation is going to correct for that. Think about, for example, if you wanted to compare the variation in home values in Indianapolis to the variation in home of home values in Beverly Hills. The homes in Beverly Hills are going to be much more expensive and you would expect that the variance, the value of the variance, is actually going to be larger. But that doesn't mean that the spread around the mean of those homes is larger than in Indianapolis. The coefficient of variation takes this into account. The coefficient of variation allows you to compare the standard deviation across various data sets, but if the size of the values in the individual data sets vary, uh, vary significantly. So, for example, compare the home values in San Francisco to the home values in Indianapolis. Then the home values in San Francisco are significantly higher than in Indianapolis, and hence the standard deviation is going to be, by, by construction, is going to be larger in San Francisco than in Indianapolis. But you may be interested in the difference in spread around the mean. Okay? Now, let us consider the data in homes CV, and you can see that in the first column that the home values are low or lower. Note that those home values are measured in $1,000. And in the second data set, they are uh, larger. Now, suppose that you calculate the standard deviation of those home values and say homes uh, 1 and you do the same for homes too. Now, when you evaluate the selection, what you find is that although the value of homes one is lower than the value of homes two in terms of, of size, that they have very similar standard deviations. Now, what you can do to calculate the coefficient of variation for both uh, home data sets, let us assign the term uh, CV1, or CV for coefficient of variation, uh, homes one, would be equal to the standard deviation divided by the mean. And we do the same for the second data set. Now what you see is that the standard deviation from both data sets is normalized by the mean. And you see that for homes one, the coefficient of variation is twice the size than the for homes two. What this means is that for homes one, the variation is significantly larger than the variation for homes two. Okay? So you can compare the coefficient of variation between various data sets because you have taken into account the mean and the size of the observations. The last topic of today's lecture are quantiles. Quantiles are the values that divide the ordered observations into n subsets, each containing the same percentage of observations. There are n-1 quantiles.
if you want to divide your observations into n parts. Note that we have already seen the media, which divides the observations into two subsets, each containing 50%. There are specific quantiles. Here we are going to look at what are called quartiles. If you divide your observations into four parts, each containing 25% of the observation. Quintiles, you are dividing your observations into five parts, each containing 20%. And then the last one are called percentiles. If you are dividing the observations into 100 different subsets. Now, let us look at the murder data or the homicide data from Norway. Note that we have 17 observations and I have ordered those observations in ascending order. Okay. So this is not a time series right now. Now we have seen that the median is the value that subdivides the group of obs the observations into the bottom 50 and top 50%. Here we have 17 observations. So we have 33 as the value, as the ninth value. And hence, the value of 33 is also the median. When you are calculating quartiles, the median is also called Q2. In this case, it is 33. Now, the quartile divides the observations into four equal parts. So, when you're looking at the subset of numbers that are below the median, we have eight numbers, and hence the first quartile, Q1, is equal to 30 which means 25% of observations are below, below the value of 30 and 25% and 75% of observations are above the value of 30. We can do the same to find Q3, but note in this case, the value is between 38 and 39. If you take the average, you find that the value of Q3 would be equal to 38.5. Note that when you are actually using MATLAB or also other statistical software, that they take into account of how the values are distributed. So when you execute this operation in MATLAB, you find that the third quartile is actually 38.25. So there's a slight difference compared to simply taking the mean. Now you can calculate the interquartile range. And the interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1, which in this case amounts to 38.25. minus 30 is equal to 8.25. So if you want to construct a box plot, then think about it the following way. We have the variable x, in this case it is homicides in Norway, on the vertical axis and think about that the box or the box and whisker plot summarizes or represents the interquartile range. So the values at the bottom is 30 and the value is 
38.25. Yeah. And note that when you have a box and whisker plot, you also have the value of median represented by a straight line. So here we have the median of 30. Now note to construct two whisker, whiskers, we have to do two steps. Let us first look at temporary whiskers. Let us first take the 8.25, which is the interquartile range, and multiply it by 1.5. This is going to get us 12.375. So now we subtract. So here I'm just having just using dashed lines. So we take 30 minus 12.375 and we get a value of 17.625. Then we do the upper value of 38 Point two five plus twelve times three seven five is equal to fifty point six two five. Now you are comparing the lower values of seventeen point six two five. So just assume it is here, 17.625. And the upper value is at 50.625. We are now comparing those values to the actual observations. And we see that the value of 25 is still within this range. And hence the lower whisker is simply going to stop at 25. And since the upper or the highest value is 50 and is still within the bounds, then the value here only goes to 50. And this is how you would construct a box and whisker plot manually. Note that this, of course, is much easier if you are using MATLAB. To illustrate the concept of quantiles, we are going to use the datasets MH or Meridian Hills and the murder data or homicide data from Norway again. To construct quartiles, we have to use the function quantiles. or quantile in MATLAB. So suppose that you want to have the calculate, suppose you want to calculate the quartiles of the homicide data in Norway, then you have to type Norway dot murder comma, and then you have to indicate the cutoff points that you desire. So for quartiles, the three cutoff points would be 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0.75. When you evaluate this, you now get the three cutoff points. You get Q1, which is 30. You get Q2, the median, which is 33. And you get Q3, which is 32.25. So 25% of murder, of homicide, or 25% of years have uh, 30 or lower murders, 25% have between 30 and 33 murders, and so on. 
You can do the same for the housing data in Meridian Hills. Here you have to type in uh, MH price. And when you execute this or evaluate this, you see the three cutoff points. So the first quarter has homes valued at about $180,000 or below. 25% of homes are valued between $180,000 and $250,000. Then 25% of homes are valued between $250,000 and uh, $400,000. $52,000 and 25% of homes are higher, priced higher than $452,000. Okay. Now, since we have calculated the quartiles, we can now also go uh, with plotting the box plots. And here you can use the function box plot. Let us, you, let, let us do a box plot for, for the murder data in Norway. So you can simply type in box plot. You evaluate this and you get the graph, which shows you the box plot for the murder data. Note that when you hover with the mouse over the picture, that you get the various uh, points. So you have the lower is the low whisker is at 25, the maximum is 50, and you have 17 points. Note that it also indicates you the number of outliers. Outliers are values that are outside of the of the of those whiskers, which is 1.5 times the interquartile range. And there are all zero outliers. Now this is different if we look at the data from the home values in Meridian Hills. So when you type in the box plot here, then here we can see that there are no outliers at the there are no outliers at the bottom but there are significant outliers at the top. Remember that the lower box, the box indicates the first quartile and the third quartile. The length of the whisker is 1.5 times the interquartile range and everything that is above or, in the, uh, or below are outliers. So here you see that you have a total of 12 outliers, okay? So those in this case are very expensive, uh, very expensive homes. It could also be homes that are very low priced. Okay. So this is how you construct a box and Mr. plot in MATLAB. Now, the last topic that I want to talk about is what is called an empirical distribution function. Now, to plot an empirical distribution function in MATLAB, you can type in CDF plot and then the data series that you would like to plot. And in this case, let us do the price data of homes in the Meridian Hills neighborhood. And what you do, what you get is this picture here. Okay. Note that you have this picture also in your slides. And I'm going to explain next of how to interpret this empirical cumulative distribution function. Okay, so here we have this empirical distribution function. And note that on the horizontal axis, you have the home values. And on the vertical axis here, you have the deciles in this case. Deciles means that those are the 10% increments of the data. Now, before we have said that the median of the data set, okay, is the value of the homes, is the value of the home 
which leaves 50% below and 50% of the home values above. Now in this case, we can see that we have the 50% here and hence we have the median value right here. Now, if you are interested in, well, in the area of Meridian Hills, say how many homes are below, say, um, uh, $500,000, which is right here, then you would see that based on the data, you can see that approximately 78% of homes have a value of below $500,000 and that 22% of homes are valued uh, at $500,000 or above. The same is true if you are interested in say how many homes are valued below or above $1 million, okay, which is the value here. Then you can see that it is only about 5% of homes that is that are valued uh, at more than $1 million and that 95% are valued at below $1 million. Okay? So this is how you interpret the empirical cumulative distribution function.